Hello and welcome to Newswire. I'm Aiza Umar. Now, despite U.S. President Trump's reassurances that the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant has almost eliminated the latest standoff between U.S.-backed Syrian forces against a small pocket of ISIL fighters continues, continues in Bahus. But the question remains that after this decisive battle, is the civil war in Syria coming to a close? Camps for the internally displaced are filling up fast, with mostly women and children raising concerns from humanitarian organizations. The fact remains that the conflict has stolen millions of childhoods and left them traumatized, vulnerable to exploitation and lacking access to basic rights as education and clean water. Red Cross officials fear the overburdened Al Hol camp in northeastern Syria, which has been in recent weeks especially inundated with civilians and ISIL fighters fleeing from Barouz, is on the brink of collapse. A report issued by the United Nations International Children's Fund's Emergency Fund has declared 2018 as the deadliest year for children in Syria since the war began nine years ago. Now, according to this report, more than 1,100 children were killed last year alone. And most of these deaths occurred due to unexploded ordnance. Today, we are trying to understand the situation in Syria on the ground from those who have reported on it and work closely with the displaced. And also, we will be talking to anti-war activists and experts on the future of Syria. To begin today's program, I'd like to introduce two of my guests who are joining us from parts of the world. First of all, we have Ms. Maram Susli, who is an activist, anti-war activist. And also with us is Ms. Nora Nylan, who is a co-founder of the NGO United Against Inhumanity. Welcome to Newsbuyer. I want to start with you, Ms. Maram. You have been very vocal uh, in terms of what exactly is the situation in Syria in terms of international, regional players. If you could highlight what, in your view, is U.S.'s role in trying to resolve the conflict. I think uh, it's quite the opposite. The U.S. isn't uh, having a role of resolving the conflict. In fact, they had the role of creating and prolonging the conflict to this day. I mean, the U.S. is illegally occupying Syria against international law. They have no, no U.N. mandate and they don't have invitation from the Syrian government, which is a sovereign nation. Uh, they are funding militias and fighting ISIS. But in the first place, uh, they're uh, providing of weapons and uh, support to militias to try to regime change Syria is the reason why al-Qaeda and ISIS has been empowered. In fact, you know, the groups that the U.S. gave arms to and uh, support, in, including bombing Syria for, uh, not only are they ideologically aligned to ISIS and fighting alongside um, al-Qaeda, but in fact, they are guilty of much larger human rights violations, including beheading children, eating hearts, uh, and bombing civilians. I mean, they are equivalent to ISIS and Al Qaeda. And of course, you know, even when it comes to the militias such as the YPG, that they are uh, now, uh, or SDF they call, that they are fighting ISIS alongside, you know, they have also been accused of ethnically cleansing the uh, Sunni population in the east of the Euphrates region of Syria, as well as the Assyrian Christian population, which um, they have forcibly disarmed in some cases and assassinated the leaders of. So the problem with the U.S. occupation is not only that it is uh, preventing uh, Syrian military from taking care of uh, these terrorist groups, uh, sometimes bombing Syria if it gets too close, but also occupying the oil wealth of Syria and preventing Syria from uh, using its resources so if to, you were to uh, highlight, stand Maram, up on its If you were to highlight for us in a few words, what is the main motive? Because there was seen an attempt to withdraw U.S. forces by President Trump, and now, of course, news is that 200 more uh, soldiers will remain on the ground. So what, in your view, is the intention of them staying there or staying involved in Syria? Uh, it's divide and conquer. The aim or th is that they want to establish a separate state east of the Euphrates or federalized Syria in order to balkanize the country, prevent or delay its rebuilding. Because at the end of the day, the U.S. is strategically allied with Israel. And they're doing this because it benefits Israel. 
It benefits Israel and also at the cost of the human lives there. It's an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. One of the biggest conflict zones in the world today, catching headlines. And here, before the presidential 2020 race begins, President Trump is obviously trying to weigh in on his voters. Doesn't this harm his, uh, this intention, if it were true, doesn't it harm his uh, 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 securing another uh, uh, term? Absolutely. I mean, the problem was that he ticketed uh, and won on the basis that he was going to end regime change wars and pull troops out of Syria. And when he did say that he was going to pull troops out of Syria, he, he even, uh, you know, talked about how the, the fallen U.S. soldiers would be happy with it. Everyone was pleased. But of course, his circle that he allowed to be around him uh, reined him in. And of course, this is going to uh, weaken his next presidential uh, bill because it uh, has lost a lot of his base support, as well as the fact that um, there is many other promises that he failed to achieve. So what do you think is the way forward? Where is the Arab world's involvement when it comes to resolving the issue in Syria? Unfortunately, the Arab world has been aligned with the United States. They they were led to believe that uh, the war in Syria will be quickly over, that they will be able to regime change uh, the Syrian government and, and install their own puppets. Um, and they were instrumental in funding al-Qaeda and ISIS and the other militia groups. Qatar especially was uh, one of the largest funders of the al-Qaeda group that's currently in Idlib. Um, and Turkey has been no help as well, you know, if they were to uh, uh, change perhaps their idea and uh, pull back from this aggressive position, uh, perhaps then they would be helpful. All right. And here I'd like to pull in uh, Ms. Nora and Alan, you into the conversation. Obviously, while the political uh, turmoil continues at the cost of human lives, could you tell us a little about the UN Refugee Agency doing for displaced people in Syria? And also, uh, first of all, highlight the humanitarian crisis for us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Well, as we all know, this is the Syria is entering the ninth year of this war, which has been absolutely devastating for civilians, women, children, and men. And that situation persists as the armed um, armed conflict uh, eases a bit. It, it persists, but um, as the Assad regime has regained more territory. The situation of those who are affected, and it's more than half the population, have been uprooted, both as internally displaced people and as refugees. Um, there is little prospect in the near future that they can have any, um, be able to live in inhumane conditions, given the situation on the ground and given the dynamics of the geopolitics that perpetuates uh, the, the problem in Syria. In terms of the specific question about refugees, um, there are something like uh, five million people who are uprooted outside the country, the majority in the region, also some here in Europe. It is unclear or difficult to see how those who fled the fighting over this past few years would entertain going back to a situation that is even more repressive in many instances than when they left. That is a grave concern, and of course, there's a lot of international uh, funding required to, su to support these refugees in various neighboring countries. But one of the things that the UNICEF report highlights is the uh, very high number of children who have died in Syria last year, uh, over 1,100. Yeah, I don't know if that's the highest toll over this past eight, nine years. But uh, unfortunately, it's not unusual that it's children who are the, often the most vulnerable will suffer the most. And as we've seen up in North uh, Syria, the number of babies, not just kids, the number of, of um, newborn babies that have died since the conditions are so terrible. And I guess the, the mothers have also been not in good health condition. So indeed, the situation of children is deplorable. Mm -hmm. And um, the extent to which concern about the humanitarian situation can override other geopolitical concerns is, is, is in doubt. Uh, almost invariably, the situation of women and children, those who suffer, who suffer the most, is often marginalized in these situations.
And it's not just the UNICEF report that create that uh, exposes a very alarming situation. There are more reports that have come in. Uh, I believe you mentioned uh, one report, the Commissioner of Inquiry highlights the humanitarian crisis in Syria. Could you tell us a little about that? Well, the Commission of Inquiry is a body that has grown out of, it's a product of the Human Rights Council, which is about to meet here in Geneva in the coming days. And that's actually operating in parallel to the donor conference in Brussels that started yesterday. What the Commission of Inquiry reports do is document uh, the different types of problems that Syrians have been confronted with from, um, for example, the high number, the very high level of arbitrary detention and it's well known that um, the number, the last figure I looked at was over something like 900,000 people have disappeared in detention and where the conditions of, of torture and inhumane treatment has resulted in a lot of loss of lives. It looks at that, it looks at the different situations in different parts of Syria up in Afrin and what might, and uh, again, the absence of the rule of law and how the different warring parties, including non-state armed actors, is making life near impossible for the people living there. There's also a great I mean, concern oh, of, there's also a great concern for children or foreign fighters uh, as uh, these camps are filling up with either the wives or the children of these foreign fighters, they are stuck between a sort of a no man's land situation. What will become of them? Well, good question. Uh, it, it appears that there are some aid workers, aid, or aid organizations involved, but with very limited access. Uh, the governments, because these ISIL fighters included a lot of non-Syrian fighters, including from Europe, and it seems that for the most part, with a few exceptions, governments are not prepared to have these people back, and that in effect means that the spouses and the children are also not accepted back. I mean, this is, this is a real problem, and it shows the extent to which humanitarian values are wanting. Right, and again, there is a, a big summit that is taking place in Brussels at the moment, which is being co-chaired by the EU and the UN. When these kind of uh, events take place in order to highlight situations, as is this one is specifically for Syria, what is effectively the conclusion of these summits? Is there any, any effective on-ground uh, resolution for the sake of the people who are in this, uh, stuck in this conflict? A, ma a major focus of the conference in Brussels, it's a fundraising effort. And uh, at this point of the situation in Syria, uh, support for humanitarian work, financial support for humanitarian work, is facing a number of question marks, since uh, there's a certain assumption that people will return or will be encouraged to return, to put it mildly, and, the ex and then concerns about the extent to which support for humanitarian um, activities, including the regeneration of healthcare, education, food supplies, the extent to which that may be diverted to the Assad regime. So the concern then is that the traditional donors and the bulk of donors for Syria have come from the West, that they're going to be less supportive than before. And again, then this results in a more difficult situation for people who need life-saving support. So, and, and if you were to highlight the greatest concern right now for children and women in Syria, uh, where they need uh, the most help, and is there any part in Syria that has returned to normalcy? Well, I, I think to use the word normalcy in Syria is a complicated term, but I mean, the Syrians in different parts of the country, of course, have suffered the same, but also suffered differently. Um, I presume in the areas that were always under the Assad regime control are somewhat better off than those were subjected to more intense fighting. I mean, the broad answer to the question of what is needed for children and their families, it's peace. And... Uh, it's a big discussion what will constitute a sustainable peace in Syria. Going on from that, from a human rights and a humanitarian perspective, I mean, there needs to be a basic rule of law that treats people, that allows people to enjoy their basic rights. People need to have access to basic services. I mean, the war has been devastating in lives. More than half a million people have been killed. But it's also been devastating in terms of the destruction of infrastructure. I mean, the Assad regime had a policy of deliberately destroying healthcare facilities. So that obviously is going to be a huge problem going forward, how to regenerate 
uh, access to basic essential services that are vital for everyday living, whether this is food, clean water, health care, vaccinations, etc. Right. And Madam, here, as we are talking about reconstruction, it raises a big ethical question of whether the reconstruction of conflict zones after the war is over in itself is a business opportunity for stakeholders. That's absolutely right. I mean, I think some of the reluctance of the U.S., or European states to uh, put in money or support the reconstruction efforts in Syria as they see no financial gain from it at this point uh, because the Syrian government is still uh, in power and they had hoped that they would get uh, a new government installed that which would give them contracts where they could uh, basically force Syria into a deep amount of unpayable debt and uh, leech the resources from the country. I mean, the, the, uh, the European and US states uh, companies especially were rubbing their hands together thinking about all of these reconstruction contracts that they could possibly get once the war is over. And I think a lot of this uh, feigned concern for humanitarianism or people is not genuine. I mean, uh, you know, the Syrian government was accused of uh, uh, destroying the health infrastructure. But the, before the war began, of course, Syria was 98% sufficient in uh, creating its own drugs. Uh, but after the war, since especially in Aleppo, all the factories were uh, looted by the rebels. Um, a lot of the hospitals were being garrisoned and used um, for military military purposes. Uh, the the problem was that now Syria is really in need of uh, outside support to get the health care and medicine that they need. However, the European states and the U.S., um, they have sanctions placed on Syria to prevent such health care from getting into the country. So again, you know, they claim to care about humanitarianism and the Syrian people, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but then they are devastating Raqqa on one hand and preventing health care and medications from getting in the country basically putting a siege on the entire uh, Syrian people. And uh, it's really just politics at the end of the day. Um, nobody really cares about people. So the, the sanctions you mentioned, that they also sort of serve a different purpose altogether. And the, the people who suffer the most are the uh, ones on the ground, the civilians. The situation in Idlib, for example, the demilitarized zone, uh, which was supposed to be a safe haven for the civilians, just last few weeks we've seen reports of 59 children dead there. Yeah, that's interesting. Idlib especially, uh, you know, that's one of the last vestiges of uh, control of basically Al-Qaeda. I mean, the U.S. State Department said that uh, Al-Qaeda is the biggest group, Al-Nusra Front, or whatever they've changed their name to now. Um, they are in control of the area. At the, the, uh, France and Europe, they seem to have no problem sending aid into that region in spite of the fact that it's being run by al-qaeda so it's not so much that they are worried that such aid is going to be used uh, by assad regime or whoever is in power right. because they really have no problem sending in aid to regions that are controlled by um, al-qaeda and right. the best scenario would be for the the uh, legitimate sovereign state that is recognized by the united nations to control all regions of Syria, obviously, Let's, and uh, return law Madam, and order. Please, let's and hold that, that thought. Madam, hold that thought. We want to talk about uh, the proposed solutions that uh, both of you have. But first, let me come another guest who's just joining us from Brussels, Mr. Uh, Fadil Abdul. Thank you for joining us here on Newswire. I understand uh, you have very little time as you're involved in the third session that is being co-chaired by the EU and the, uh, and the UN on uh, supporting the future of Syria and the region. Could you tell us a little about what you're hoping to achieve in this conference? Thank you very much. But let me clarify one thing that uh, what your guest is saying is, not, is totally wrong. And any like clear uh, search through Google, they can reveal that uh, like lots of government funds have been stopped since Al-Nusra seized Idlib. And that thing is very clear. And uh, and the uh, and the past week I was in the the U.S. and I visited State Department and I visited the White House as well and I spoke with several like um, officers in the U.S. and the, and they never actually fund Idlib. So I don't know from the, the, just throwing information. This is not the, the good way actually to talk as an expert as a, a researcher. Regarding the Brussels conference. 
Uh, like uh, uh, we hope to deliver our messages in Syria about the reconstruction, mainly and about the, dis uh, the displaced uh, people, the forced displaced people. Uh, first of all, regarding the uh, reconstruction, we believe that the EU is committed uh, to uh, to bind the reconstruction with the political solution, because uh, otherwise it will be rewarding the uh, the, the criminals actually. Uh, then regarding the displaced people, which is mainly about half of the Syrian population, uh, actually uh, no. we believe also that the circumstances inside Syria are so, uh, un, uh, still uh, un, unsafe, uh, unsafe, actually. And um, the refugees uh, mainly didn't uh, return it back uh, okay. to, to, to the area which is, have been displaced falsely from there. Uh, right. Even in, even if they are IDP inside Syria, mm -hmm. so uh, our monitoring showing that uh, no one is returned or or maybe a, a very few limited family. Right, uh, but to coming back to the conference, to coming back to the conference, as you mentioned, not just to highlight the situation on the ground, but also to uh, get more support for reconstruction uh, in Syria. It it brings the question really that how. Uh, uh, how effective is it to be talking about reconstruction right now where the situation like in Idlib, a demilitarized zone, has seen the situation worsen, actually? Yeah, actually, uh, we need to confirm that uh, the reconstruction will not start. And that's what we get, actually, confirmation. So, as I mentioned, they commit to, to, this, uh, to this issue because... Uh, the, comp the Russian and the Iranian company, they want to be rewarded after they invested like a billion dollars in Syria. So uh, they are pushing to say that everything in Syria is calm, the uh, refugees have been back, and we need to start reconstruction. So this is, this is a very, very clear message that the reconstruction will never start without political solution. And about the sanction as well, the continuous of sanction that also uh, uh, affect the regime a lot, and the Iranian as well. And the Assad visit to Iran in order to try to avoid the, those sanctions, actually. So, so it's that, still, uh, it's still puts... sanction right. for the sanction itself. The, the sanction in order to pressure Assad to sit on the, on the table in order to uh, find a deal. And, and lead our country to democratic country to election, not only the family minority rule. This is what our country has been led since 50 years. Right, but the concern still remains that if the military objectives are placed above civilian governance by all those concerned there in Syria, all parties, it essentially crucially creates a vacuum uh, for the rule of law. Yeah, of course, but, but we need here to, ha to, to recognize between the Syrian regime and the other part, uh, pa uh, parties as well. Even the extremist group, the Syrian regime and his militia, mainly the Iranian militia as well, is uh, responsible for about 90% from the total crimes have been committed in Syria, which is described by the Commission of Inquiry uh, of Syria the uh, uh, crimes against humanity. This is widespread and systematic. The other committed crime, the extremist group, the opposition, the PYD, the Kurd PYD, uh, the international coalition led by the U.S., the Russian forces, but those are about 10 percent. The, the total crimes committed by the government itself against the, their own population. And that's and that, uh, based on what we have been documented since eight years by daily basis. So that's what our database reflected. This is not, this is not actually, we are exaggerating the, the regime, what he's doing. No, this is the reality, actually. So, the so when we are speaking about total, uh, and this recognition, as I mentioned, is this recognition, you can found it in 14 reports of the experts of the okay. presentation let me, from the United let Nations. Let me... Let me involve the other guests in this also, since we're running out of time. Madam, very quickly, your idea of how this will be resolved. I mean, he's saying that there needs to be a political solution before reconstruction begins and uh, before sanctions can be lifted. What this sounds like to me is that they're still insisting on the, their uh, military uh, 
so their, their demands are basically that Syria should change its constitution and have federalism to balkanize the country, to end support for the uh, Hezbollah militia that threatens Israel. At the end of the day, what they couldn't achieve militarily in Syria, they're trying to now achieve with economic blackmail. And that's just punishing the Syrian people uh, and not the government or the players. They're really just punishing uh, people because they didn't get what they want out of the Syrian war at the end of the day. Uh, of course, reconstruction will uh, uh, allow the infrastructure for refugees to return. Uh, reconstruction starts first, economy uh, rises, and then refugees will have a safe place to return. That, that's the way it is. Uh, the political peace solution, the wait. peace in Syria... But obviously, peace has to play a big factor here. I mean, even before reconstruction starts and yes. refugees return, if there is no government in place, if there is a continuation of a civil war, how is that going to be achieved? That's the big question here. Well, there is, there is a government in place. However, uh, you're right in that this war is not going to be over and things are not going to go get back to normal until that government that is in power takes control of every region of Syria that's currently being run by illegal militias or is currently being occupied by foreign powers. Uh, nothing is going to change unless these things are, uh, you know, uh, completed or over with. And that's why I, I can assure you that the next front is going to be the Idlib front and the Syrian military along with Russia is going to go in. Okay. And in the past, the U.S. has threatened to bomb Syria if that, uh, if that happens to protect the militias, the Al-Qaeda-linked militias that are controlling the place. But unless... Uh, uh, you know, this uh, war is over and uh, the the European and Western powers give up on their idea that they could ch uh, influence change within Syria through weaponry or economic blackmail. Uh, nothing is going to change and, and the, the suffering of people is going to continue. Right. And Ms. Nora, we're coming to the end of this segment quickly. Uh, Save the Children have declared Syria the most dangerous place in the world for children. And as you heard both our guests, there is a, a not a very easy consensus or a solution to this problem. Could you highlight for us what is at stake here when it comes to the people, the civilians on the ground? What is at stake, as in any war-affected situation, the solution is dependent on going forward with an inclusive governance that recognizes and honors and respects and promotes the human rights of all its citizens. That's what's called positive peace. It is good that uh, much of the uh, armed conflict has, um, has diminished over this past year. That is a positive. However, having said that, more than 1.5 million people were displaced last year in Syria. So going forward, uh, I think it needs to be understood how context in which the armed conflict began, it was Syrian people who objected to repression, and we all know what happened from that. To go forward and in a peace and to avoid the number of children currently being killed, for that to stop, um, the situation in which people are living, and it includes the political situation, needs to be addressed so that people can live normal, regular lives in a way where they do not have to be worried about barrel bombs or the deliberate destruction of healthcare facilities, uh, sieges that were obliging people to go without food. I mean, there were sieges that didn't allow access to food, etc. So in the year 2019, let, let us hope and let us work for a Syria where the citizens of Syria can enjoy a modicum of peace and humanity. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Nora and Ms. Maram. Also, Mr. Fadil giving us time here on Newswire. With that, we will take a quick short break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Newswire. Now, moving on to our second top story of the day. With the clock ticking towards 29th March, the deadline for UK's exit from the EU, British MPs have voted overwhelmingly against the Prime Minister's withdrawal deal yet again. Last time, uh, Theresa May put the agreement to parli Parliament in January. She suffered a major defeat as the deal agreed with the EU after 18 months of painstaking negotiations was thrown out by a margin of 230 votes. 
The latest defeat raises pressure on UK Prime Minister Theresa May and increases the prospect of a Brexit delay or even a second referendum. To understand this better, first let's connect with our correspondent who yesterday was speaking to the people on the ground in London to understand their sentiments. Well, today presents a significant challenge to Theresa May and her government. It is the day when members of the UK Parliament will vote on her deal for the UK to leave the European Union. It follows a failed attempt in January when MPs rejected her deal then by a significant majority, including members from her Conservative governing party that revolted. Uh, the main issues that remain, though, are over trade, but there is this contentious issue of the Irish backstop. That's between the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Many believe that that should remain open. She took it back to Brussels last night and got it in there just in time, she believes, for a policy, a term to remain in place, that the border can remain open. However, that cannot be a permanent feature for the UK's withdrawal from the European Union in the event the deal is accepted tonight by MPs. Nevertheless, the public remain very passionate over this issue, both on the Remain and the Leave side. And what if it's a hard Brexit? Great! That's right, what that's we want! Yeah. That's what everybody voted for. Clean Brexit. Yeah. Out and we are out, 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 out 29th of March, we are out. Personally, for me, ever since the first oh, referendum, I thought we needed to just ask people, are you sure? So you can call it whatever you want to, but I do think with such a massive change, um, which is not at all what was promised in, in the referendum, I think we should just ask people, are you sure this is what you want to do? Well, there you have it, some very passionate voices there. We won't, of course, find out the outcome of the vote until an estimated time of around 7 or 8 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time tonight. That's when the MPs will vote on the deal, a deal that could change Britain and the European Union's landscape ahead. But in the event that deal is not accepted, MPs are scheduled to return tomorrow, well, they will have to take that decision as to whether or not they believe that the UK should lead the European Union without a deal with Brussels. Joseph Hyatt, Indus News, London. And the MPs did vote. Overwhelming majority of MPs voted against it. Now let me introduce our guests to better understand what the situation is. We have with our citizen rights campaigner from Belfast, we have Emma de Souza and also Professor Alex de Reuter, Director of Centre of Brexit Studies, Birmingham City University. Welcome to the show, both of you. I want to start with you, uh, Professor Alex. Overwhelming majority of MPs voted against the withdrawal deal. Why do people oppose the deal, Professor Alex? Alex. Well, opposition to a deal, a deal has come from both sides. Uh, crucially for European Research Group MPs, that's those hard Brexit Tories and the DUP of Northern Ireland. Their main concern with this agreement is that it did not have an explicit time limit put in place to the Northern Ireland backstop. Of course, for the DUP, with uh, one of their politicians, Sammy Wilson, you know, uh, suggested that only the UK Parliament should be sovereign in regards to making that decision. So on the one side of the debate, you had that objection. On the other side, of course, you had the, the vast bulk of the Labour Party, all but a handful of their MPs and the opposition parties, also vote against it because, for them, it's not good enough. I mean, it's too hard a Brexit for them. And for the Labour Party, of course, their preferred approach is to have a permanent customs union with the EU. I'm not sure what practical difference that makes to having a backstop, which pretty much guarantees the same thing. But for both of those sides, Theresa May's agreement simply wasn't good enough. And the the preferred approach of the Labour Party is still to try and force a general election on the back of this. Now, Emma, bringing you into this conversation also, the backstop issue, a contentious issue right now that has caused, uh, created a lot of criticism from the public also. This, of course, rings uh, uh, close to home for you, doesn't it? Absolutely. And um, I think it's interesting to think about what the backstop is. The backstop is an insurance policy to protect the peace process and protect the Good Friday Agreement. And I think the fact that uh, so many uh, MPs are voting against the backstop and there's all this contention around the backstop represents a disregard for the Good Friday Agreement because that is what the backstop is to protect. Right. And could you tell us a little more about how uh, this involves you personally? Because uh, it does bring into question uh, the very citizenship, whether uh, the Irish, uh, they choose to be uh, recognized as Irish or British. Uh, yes, I mean, that is a serious problem here in Northern Ireland. Under the Good Friday Agreement, 
the people of Northern Ireland have the birthright, whether they can be Irish or British or both. Yet, and in that, there should be equal treatment and no deferential treatment between the two communities. But with Brexit, we're seeing a hardening of identities in Northern Ireland, and people no longer have a choice because if someone wants to be a British citizen but they'd like to have the same rights as their Irish neighbour, they have to go and get an Irish passport in order to do so. So there's a lot of questions being raised here in Northern Ireland about identity, about citizenship, about our EU rights. We're hearing a lot of talk about Irish citizens in Northern Ireland becoming second-class citizens uh, post-Brexit, but at present we already are second-class Irish citizens. And what we're going to see is a deterioration of our rights as EU citizens post-Brexit. Right. So, Professor Alex, then now what happens next? Well, uh, MPs will vote uh, today. That's uh, Wednesday UK time on, on giving them a chance to say they don't want no deal. I mean, there's clearly no majority in Parliament for a no deal scenario, but of course that would still require the uh, UK government to come up with a viable alternative to Theresa May's agreement that the EU would be willing to accept, and they're not going to renegotiate this agreement. So beyond that, then we get another proposed uh, amendment on Thursday by a couple of politicians about Cooper, Oliver Letwin, seeking to extend Article 50. Now, it may well be, and most likely would be, that Theresa May would seek to try and get an extension for a couple of months anyway, in order to perhaps try and get some more time to pressure Parliament into accepting her deal or, or no Brexit, as it were. Uh, but alternatively, uh, that, in effect, might be taken out of her hands. It, it's, it's very difficult to say. I think the one thing that is certain is that um, I, I, I would almost certainly bet that an extension of some sort will be in the offing, simply for no other reason than uh, we're running out of time to, to you know, put forward any viable alternatives to this current scenario. Right. And the clock is ticking in terms of no deal. So, P Professor Alex, is it also, it's expected today there will be a vote, and what is the sort of expectation of how that will turn out? Oh, I think the vast majority of MPs will vote against uh, no deal being a, a, a fallback position for the UK government in this regard. If that then happens, then, then the onus is on government and parliament to come up with a credible alternative that the EU will accept. I mean, EU leaders have made it very clear that they're unlikely to ex accept an extension to this Article 50 period simply mm -hmm. for the UK government to try and have more time to make up its mind. There needs to be some kind of plan in place for what the UK government wants to do. Right. Uh, past indications have suggested that another referendum or a general okay. election, for example, would, would, be, would be acceptable. But I, I don't right. think simply Let's... trying to buy enough. Let me, let me ask you, Emma, also what the sentiment is on the streets there in Belfast if you are to talk about uh, the options out there, soft Brexit, hard Brexit. I mean, what is uh, the leaning towards mostly? I mean, you have to remember that Northern Ireland voted to remain um, and we are going to be the only part of the UK with a land border with the EU. With the EU. So it's really important here that the border is open. Uh, the border for us is not just infrastructure, it's not just land, it's an emotional border. And any kind of infrastructure on that border represents going back uh, to, to before the peace process with the people here. But uh, with the situation now and the no deal um, vote that's happening this evening, I mean, I would expect uh, an echo Alex's point there that there is an overwhelming majority against a no deal. But at the same time, there is this misconception that keeping no deal on the table is a bargaining chip. And um, today we've seen released uh, tariffs and information on a no-deal Brexit. And curiously, uh, in that, we've seen that Northern Ireland will be treated differently from the rest of the UK in the event of a no-deal. And considering that's what they voted against last night, um, it's quite interesting to see that that's what's going to happen in the event of a no-deal. OK, hold on to that thought. Very quickly, let's hear what Joseph Hyatt, our correspondent in London, found out yesterday night after the vote. Well, tonight, Theresa May's deal has been defeated 391 to 242. It's yet another blow for this current government and her leadership, which has been desperately seeking to arrange and negotiate a sufficient deal that would pass through Parliament, uh, which failed to do so yet again. Uh, Theresa May appeared uh, clearly affected by this circumstance when she appeared at the dispatch box. Uh, but the wider issue now, the wider question for the British public is what direction is the country heading in? And that is an unclear and certainly uncharted water 
matters in the days ahead. Tomorrow, MPs will be given the opportunity to go before the House and to vote on whether they choose to uh, take the UK out of the European Union with a no-deal Brexit, effectively taking us out without any clear clarity on trade, on customs union, etc. It would be a bit of an uncharted territory. Those on the Leave side have often been quite uh, supportive of that idea. They want to take back control, as they call it, uh, whereas by those on the Remain camp are optimistic that MPs will reject that concept of falling out, crash hard with a hard Brexit, and instead will look towards Thursday, where on Thursday there is the hope, if it was rejected, uh, there would be an opportunity for MPs to decide if they choose to extend Article 50. In the event that happens, those that wish to see the UK remain in the European Union are optimistic that that would open the doors to uh, you know, new, renewed negotiations, but also the possibility and opportunity um, to put into the equation the idea of a second referendum or what they're calling a people's uh, vote once again. Certainly on the streets behind us, those uh, have come out to express their views throughout today. But this result was no real surprise. Uh, the MPs that we spoke to in the House earlier in the day uh, were very confident that the deal would not, would not pass. And that was uh, evident throughout MPs on all sides of the House. Uh, the impact, of course, for the UK economy remains to be seen in the hours ahead. Uh, but there will be, of course, wider implications uh, when, as we look towards Wednesday and the implications and impact to follow. Joseph Hyatt there for us from London. Now, the impact on the economy has already started to show. Professor Alex, the pound is down by more than 10% against the euro since the first referendum. The economy in UK, if you could talk a little more about this, how else is it being affected? Well, the main effect, of course, as you point out, has been, has been in terms of depreciation of the pound sterling, but we've increasingly had companies now in the manufacturing sector say that they will review operations in the UK, that new rounds of investment in the automotive sector, for example, with next generation of cars, electric vehicles and so on. These are now under threat. One key example we've already had is Honda announcing they will close down the Swindon plant in 2021. They deny Brexit was the tipping point, but in the past they've said that Brexit is a key concern for them. That's 3,500 jobs already earmarked for Oblivion, plus more in the supply chain. Other companies such as uh, Toyota and BMW have also indicated that they will review continued production and investment in the UK in light of the prospect of a no deal. So there's certainly a lot of pressure in that regard. Um, the government, of course, has now announced contingency scenarios in the event of a no deal that they would reduce tariffs on 87% of imports to zero in order to try and prevent any further price shocks to consumers and business. But it's clear the economy is taking a hit in this regard and there's potential for further damage in that regard to come. Further potential of damage to the economy. And Emma, what about the hospitality sector in Northern Ireland? Is that, is that being visibly, is there a change being seen? I, I would echo all those points there. The economy is definitely suffering um, and uh, not just in terms of uh, hospitality or all, all industries are suffering uh, from Brexit with the uncertainty that's coming forward, even in the likes of the NHS, we've seen a 90% drop uh, in EU nurses. And I think I'd like to bring in that point that it's not just uh, the economy, but it's also the free movement of people and migration has been affected by Brexit and that is having a, a wider effect on, the, on our communities as well. So coming back to you, Professor Alec, it still remains to be seen trying to figure out what the roadmap looks like in the uh, future. Is there a possibility that the EU could decline when and if the UK asks for more time? Well, to come back to my earlier point, I don't think the EU is simply likely to say yes for an extension just for more uh, naval gazing by government and parliament, uh, more fudging, as it were. I think, you know, as Mark Rutt, the Dutch Prime Minister, has recently made clear, the EU will expect a credible plan from the UK in order to, uh, you know, to see how it goes forward. And I think ultimately that would have to hinge around in all likelihood. I feel the only thing that would break this deadlock is another referendum. I don't think anything else will do it. So it would have to be something of that order of magnitude, I think. Um, I think Juncker has indicated that, you know, the UK could possibly have an extension to the end of May in order to not conflict with European Parliament elections, but there has, to, there has to be something from the government and parliament to agree on and they can present to the EU. That's the bottom line. But there's also a concern, Emma, what happens if they do not vote for a delay? Well, if they don't vote for a delay, um, uh, even if they vote down uh, no deal, uh, the, it will still be a no deal Brexit, if that's just the way it is going to be on the 29th of March, if we don't reach an agreement with the EU. That's the reality. And, and Professor Alex, it, I understand that it owns one member state in the EU to veto the extension. 
uh, and many of them have a good reason for doing so probably. So which member state can UK count on for that veto? <sighs> It, it's difficult to say. I mean, they, they, they will all come to a decision unanimously, as they put it. So I, I, I'd hate to single out any. I mean, you know, Macron typically has come in for criticism as taking a hard line against the UK, but I think it'd be a bit unfair to single out any one particular country in that regard. The key point, I think, is that, that the government is going to have to come up with a clear plan and justification for any extension. And, um, you know, to reiterate... Uh, uh, you know, the default setting for the UK is, is no deal if it doesn't come up with anything credible in the next few days. And we really are talking the next few days. Right. And, and Theresa May is obviously facing a lot of criticism uh, ever since the Brexit thing came up. Is there a possibility that she could resign? Well, she's shown uh, remarkable persistence so far. I don't think Theresa May is going to leave of her own volition. I think she would have to be forced out. Of course, her party tried to have a vote of no confidence in her a couple of months ago and she survived that so she's immune from any further moves for a, another nine months or so. Um, is it possible that Parliament might vote no confidence in the government if she uh, reneges in any of these um, promised votes, for example? I don't know, but I, th I think, you know, certainly the pressure is there building upon her. But I, I think it's most, if she goes, it'll be of her own volition. She's already said she won't contest the next election unless there's a snap election, but... Uh, no, I don't, I don't think she'll be forced out this side of um, New Year, basically. Okay. To, and, you know. and Emma, very quickly, since we're running out of time, how, in your opinion, the UK manage its border with Ireland in the event if there is a no-deal Brexit? There is just no way to, uh, to, to imagine how they're going to manage the situation with the border in Northern Ireland. I mean, the reality is it will be a land border with the EU. There is going to be regulations and customs checks and... It's just inevitable that there will have to be some kind of infrastructure or checks on that border. Now, they did release today in the no-deal preparations that products coming from Ireland into the north will not um, be tariffed, but the other way they will. So that is going to affect the farmers in the north who will be exporting to the south of, of the island who will then face tariffs going into the EU. It's going to have a massive effect um, on the farmers and the economy here. Um, so can't predict which way it's going to go, but... Um, Whatever we do, it has to maintain peace in the island of Ireland. That's got to be the priority. Thank you, Professor Alex and Miss Emma, for your contribution there to Newswire. With that, we've come to the end of the show. Stay tuned to Indus News for your latest updates. That's all from me. Goodbye.